Hello everybody, welcome to the Bible Live with Jeremiah. We just had an exciting interruption, so I had to start over. We had a dog fight outside or something of a sort uh, that involved yelping puppies. So I of course had to go find out that they were okay. And uh, now we have the kitty cat over to the left trying to dig through the trash. But, uh, so what I was saying in the video before we got interrupted was I wasn't sure which book we were going to do, whether it would be James or Ephesians. I was leaning toward Ephesians since I had spoken, you know, so highly of it just before uh, um, starting this. And I'd also mentioned that we had just finished Jude literally about 10 minutes prior, but that was maybe a half hour ago now. And uh, so now we're going to decide which book. It may not be either one of those now. Um, dealing with the dogs kind of... Uh, derailed my enthusiasm. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, let's see. Ephesians has um, six chapters. And I won't be able to read them all in one shot. Um, typically, well, when I was younger, a long time ago, uh, I don't do this anymore, but when I was younger, one of the first things I did was when I woke up, I read seven chapters. And that would take about an hour, and then I would pray or whatnot. And uh, later, I decided that it was a lot more profitable while I was a teenager, not once I hit adulthood, because then everything was so chaotic. But then I would read about three every hour, or uh, I would separate and do every other hour or something. That was a long time ago, so that is not bragging. That stuff did not retain with me, because I had um, a lot of the younger generations problems and made the same mistakes and um, so I got away from scripture and um, spiritual life all of that I'm moving forward a bit I'm gonna to try to do Ephesians for us my lighting is now a little messed up off go the glasses I'm gonna take a sip of coffee and hope Wow, I can't see anything I do apologize. My eyes are getting very bad. <clears throat> Willow, Willow thinks it's funny, though. She's going to jump up here now and go after the keyboard, I'll bet you. All right, so here we go, the book of Ephesians. Um, I'm not going to normally outline these books or anything like that, but um, this is the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians. And if, we're, if we haven't covered, well, I know we haven't, but... If you're not familiar with who Paul is, there were 12 disciples who um, were with Jesus, named the 12, you know, versus all the other disciples that he also had. But the main 12, and then you had the one, Judas Iscariot, who gave up his bishopric. Um, now God, depending on how you look at this, picked the replacement to be Paul. Um, on the road to Damascus, Paul received... Now, Paul was the largest persecutor of the church at the time. He uh, was even there holding, I believe, the coats of the people who stoned Stephen. Now, if I, get this, if I remember this correctly, Stephen was the first official Christian martyr of the church. And he's the one who looked up and said, I, be, or I, I see the throne of God or something to the sort. Paul was there. I may have the story a little mixed up, but he was there. So when Stephen died, Paul was there, and Paul went all over the place, killing the uh, the, the church members. He saw it as, uh, as to say, a violation of Jewish doctrine. Um, and Paul was one of the highest educated. Um, if you were to compare him to ministers, he'd be like way above regular ministers. Because he spent his pretty much his entire childhood, teenage years, adult life just learning the law, and um, really, um, really a very stout and prof um, not prophetic. Forgive me, profound individual when it came to knowing his stuff. So when the church happened, it was a complete offense to everything he'd spent his life learning, everything he believed everything that he believed God had said 
And so on his way to, I forget, I know he's on the road to Damascus, but I forget who he was after. I believe it was an apostle. But anyway, he had a vision. And there was a whole bunch of people with him. But um, he had this vision. He went blind. And in the vision, um, like a live vision, as in he literally saw it. So this light's talking to him. And it tells him that he is Jesus Christ. And he wants to know why Paul is persecuting his church. And Paul wants to know who he is. And he says, I am the Lord. <laughs> and so... Anyway, um, Paul was converted and he became an apostle on the grounds that he was one of the, the, um, the grounds that makes an apostle or one of the requirements is. And despite all the people running around saying they're apostles, um, the legitimate apostle, as in back in these days, everything else is just more of an office today. It's not the same thing. But back when the church started an apostle was by requirement somebody who had seen the risen Christ so that didn't make everybody an apostle but it meant that the requirement was they had to have seen the risen Christ so Paul in this saw the risen Christ and this was a spiritual happening and it made him the replacement to Judas in, in my person um, now he I believe it was for the first three years after pretty much did not really um, go anywhere truly towards the church. I may be incorrect, forgive me. But I mean, he kind of did his thing while Peter in Jerusalem did their thing. And later on, they all kind of got together and um, I forget which book it was. It may even be this one where um it talks about John and James giving him the... Um, basically the handshake of appreciation and brotherly uh, I think it was actually Romans whatever book it was it was where they made him shave his head and you know show off that he's on their side or something like that but that's a little too um, descriptive right now I tend to ramble I apologize but um, anyway um, beside Paul the other apostles did not know of Paul's existence at this time. So they needed to replace the bishopric of Judas Iscariot in their mind. So they drew lots. And uh, so they picked a man based on those lots. It's kind of like drawing straws. And so that was their way of, you know, it's kind of like rolling the dice and who's it land on. They prayed prior and that kind of um, by tradition I don't know how accurate it is but by tradition that seems to be also the same way that they uh, select the Pope it's supposed to be that they not draw lots but they're supposed to be if I'm not mistaken 100% in accord with the name they come up with but anyway moving on as I've said before I'm not technically a Catholic so I'm not 100% familiar with any of that stuff I'm just kind of giving you a little groundwork before we get into this and that was just because I wanted to explain who Paul was so this is an epistle of Paul now Paul is also famous for his spiritual understanding of Christ in a different light than others because of his entire development Um, the regular disciples, they really had no uh, religious upbringing in the sense of uh, schooling. They're just average men, the fishermen, you know, the hard workers, the laborers, the lowly of the low. Paul, I believe, was the only official person of education that there was. So he knew the law of the Jews inside and out. So when he saw the Christ... All that scripture made more sense to him than it would to any other apostle, even though all of those apostles had spent time with Christ, they'd known him in the spirit, but they didn't know him in the law. And I'm not trying to say that there's such a difference that the technicality 
has more validity. But what I'm saying is Paul understood that validity, that law, with such life in it, that the scripture was truly alive to Paul, in my opinion. Because he then, therefore, understood from beginning to end, as you'll see while he was in prison and captivity, we're, we're not... I would normally like to do it by apostle and really illustrate how each apostle perceives Christ because there's a big difference. John sees the light. Peter sees the king. Paul sees the Christ. And I mean, they all understand it from a little different perspective, but the life that they can inject into what they're relating is so profoundly intimate to the reader that it's uh, so much more valuable to us. If we take the books that that particular apostle or writer wrote and read those together and study those by themselves, not the way it's set up currently because then we get lost going from one perspective to the next perspective to the next perspective, and we kind of, it's kind of a little bit more chaotic and not as symmetrical and um, fluid and, and beautiful. Because there's a grace and there's a power to the way that each one of them approaches everything. So uh, what I was saying with Paul, though, is that when he was in prison, he could go from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the Old Testament and point out everything. And he convinced and converted so many Jews just because he was that aware and keen of the law. In other words, the law being Christ. He understood from beginning to end what it was, what we were looking for, what we believe in. And so the book of Ephesians is so powerful because you are in this book, and in my opinion, seeing his knowledge translated from law to life and life to grace and faith and everything that we believe the resurrection and on and most books in the New Testament could stand on their own and tell us the full gospel you know there's a lot of technicality to every different one but pretty much all of them if it was just the only book we had and we understood that Christ belonged to God, it would be enough for our heart. But in this particular book, it is powerful, and like I said, I'm not going to be able to read them um, all in one. So what I'm going to do, because this was a long rant, is I'm going to pause here, and uh, then we'll start. That way it's not 20 minutes of me babbling, and then we go into chapter 1, because you might not want to listen to all that and might just want to go to chapter one. So I'm going to pause this one, label it, and then we'll be right back. All right, so uh, see you in a minute.